I'm Dr. Ted Barnett, uh, President and Founder of Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute. I'm very excited to welcome you to the Lifestyle as Medicine Lecture with Robert Cheek, who will be talking about building your body on a plant-based diet. Robert Cheek grew up uh, on a farm in Corvallis, Oregon, where he adopted a vegan lifestyle in 1995 at age 15, weighing just 120 pounds. Today, he's the author of the books Vegan Bodybuilding and Fitness, Shred It, Plant-Based Muscle, the New York Times bestseller, uh, the plant-based athlete, and his latest, The Impactful Vegan, that released on June 25, 2024. He's often referred to as the godfather of vegan bodybuilding, growing the industry from infancy in 2002 to where it is today. As a natural bodybuilding champion, Robert is considered one of Veg News's, Veg News Magazine's most influential vegan athletes. His tours, he tours around the world sharing his story of transformation from a skinny farm kid to champion vegan bodybuilder. Robert Cheek is the founder and president of Vegan Bodybuilding and Fitness and maintains the website veganbodybuilding.com. He's a regular contributor to Forks Over Knives, the Center, uh, the Center for Nutrition Studies, the Vegan Gym, and No Meat Athlete. He's a former multi-sport athlete and has followed a plant-based diet for more than 28 years. We will also be joined by Dr. Susan Friedman and our medical student, Ashish, uh, who will be helping to field the questions at the end. We're going to turn it over to Robert Cheek. Building your body on a plant-based diet. Thank you for joining us. We're so excited to have you and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Barnett. And hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. And uh, let me know you can see me okay, hear me okay, and we are ready to rock. We are ready to rock. Okay, beautiful. We've got 100 people here or more. I'm excited to be here. Uh, thank you, Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute for having me. And thank you for that uh, warm introduction. It is my pleasure to be here. I just returned from a vegan cruise with Dr. Neil Barnard, who was just mentioned, and Dr. Michael Greger and Drs. Dean and Aisha Sherzai and uh, so many others, uh, Ocean Robbins and a bunch of wonderful speakers. So I just gave about 11 presentations in 12 days on a recent tour with the vegan cruise and some speaking engagements before that. So hopefully I'm nice and warmed up and ready to go for this one. You are here to learn about building your body on a plant-based diet. I'm just gonna run through a few things that we'll cover just so you know what to expect. I took some notes here. You're gonna get a little bit of my background story because that's important because I, uh, I achieved the American dream of putting on 100 pounds <laughs> on a plant-based diet. But I wanna explain how I did that, how I went from 120 pounds to a 220 pound champion vegan bodybuilder. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, calorie intake versus expenditure. We're going to discuss calorie density, nutrient density, the best foods for pre and post workout nutrition, maybe even some for during uh, during uh, workout as well. Uh, we're going to talk about building muscle and the exercises that are conducive for that. We'll talk about burning fat and the nutritional and exercise uh, components and approaches for that. We're going to talk about staying motivated as well, kind of finding your why and deciding how to show up every day and build consistent habits that become second nature and become what you do. Like Dr. Barnett was saying, he runs a 5K every day. That just becomes part of who he is, how he identifies as someone who runs every day. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the very uh, popular and controversial subjects of uh, supplementation and protein intake, of course. And I'm going to leave you with some uh, inspiration at the at the very end. So you already heard my bio, but I, I'm going to just uh, share a few things uh, with you from the get go. And you're right. I just see I saw a comment there. There's no slides. You just get me today. Uh, you're going to get me uh, and, and me only. So no slides today, but I'm you're going to get the audio and video presentation that I'm going to share with you today. So Back in 1995, before we had the internet at home, I grew up on a farm in an agriculture community and I was raising animals for, for, for food. I was selling them at the, the local uh, county auction. And, uh, you know, I, I decided at, at a young age, December 8th, 1995, that I no longer wanted to do that. I didn't want to contribute to raising animals and turning them into food. But I was also a five sport athlete. And I wondered, is it possible to build my body with only plant protein, without any animal products or byproducts whatsoever. There was no internet, there were very few books, no documentaries, not a lot of technology. There certainly wasn't this opportunity to be part of a community 
online like this and connect with people around the world. So I had to do what Dr. Michael Greger says. I had to put it to the test. So I decided I would embark on this plant-based athlete journey in the mid nineties and see how it would support my five sport athlete career. And so I did, and this is fundamentally important to just say right up front, I embraced it with all kinds of enthusiasm. And at the end of the day, it didn't work very well for me, at least for the first few weeks. And I'll tell you why. I was 15 years old, didn't have a lot of my own money. I didn't know, I knew what I didn't want to eat. I didn't want to eat animals or animal byproducts, but I wasn't exactly sure what to eat. And so my day consisted of having some cereal, probably with some soy milk or rice milk in the morning, going to school, having white refined French bread rolls as another breakfast once I got to school, chips and salsa, sesame seed bagels for lunch. I'd go to my sports practice, come home, uh, have some spaghetti, maybe put some peanut butter on top. I invented pad thai without even knowing it. And then maybe have some, believe it or not, hemp-based ice cream for dinner. If you're following along there, you realize I wasn't really eating any food. I mean, aside from the uh, tomatoes and the salsa and the nuts and the nut butter, I wasn't eating any food. No wonder it didn't work for me. No wonder I didn't feel very well. And the reason I tell that story is because many of us know someone or know multiple people that we've talked to who said, you know what? I, I tried being plant-based. It just didn't work for me. Or I tried being vegetarian. I tried being vegan. It didn't work for me. And what I want to know now, 30 years later, that I've been doing this for three decades, I want to know what you really tried. Because when I tried, I, I wasn't even eating food, yet I was expecting to support and sustain a five sport athlete career as a very high energy, uh, athletically driven individual. And I wasn't eating nutrient dense foods. And I know that is the case for many people, even well intentioned people. So I want to state that right up front. I also barely weighed over uh, over 100 pounds when I became a plant-based athlete. I weighed 89 and a quarter pounds in eighth grade, barely 100 pounds my freshman year, and all the way up to 120 pounds as a sophomore in high school when I became plant-based and adopted this lifestyle that I would continue for the rest of my life. And I wondered if I could get bigger and stronger. I was a child of the 80s, and I was watching Captain Planet and He-Man and all these, I had all these fictional and other role models who were big and strong and muscular and saving the day and doing good deeds and, and trying to lift others up and ins inspire people. And I, and I quite frankly, wanted to do that for myself, but I wasn't sure if it was possible because I grew up in an era where TV commercials were uh, about milk, it does a body good where the individuals drinking milk were getting bigger and stronger and their voice was getting deeper as they got older and drank more and more milk. And I thought, well, that's what I need to do. And I grew up in a community where beef is what's for dinner. In fact, we raised beef cattle on our farm. But my older sister who inspired me along this plant-based journey told me, listen, Robert, at the end of the day, you don't need meat, milk, and eggs. You need the nutrition that's commonly associated associated with those items, with meat, milk, and eggs, but it comes in its original form from plants in the form of amino acids, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, calcium, all these different things. And so you can cut out the middleman, cut out the, the animals and go straight to the source. So put it to the test. I went on to uh, finish out my high school athletic career. I ran cross country in college. And then I really embrace something that would change my life forever, which was checking in right here, checking in with my heart. What do I really want to do? And for me, for a variety of reasons and not just ego driven, I wanted to get bigger and stronger. Like many of us, we want something we don't have that we never experienced. I was tired of being the, the kid getting pushed around on the soccer field, soccer field or the basketball court or on the wrestling mat or whatever sport I was doing. And I also wanted to show people because I cared about animals as someone who grew up on a farm. 
I wanted to show people through my example that I could build my body without any animal protein and build significant muscle, hoping that other people would believe that they could do the same and to try it out for themselves. And so that's what I did. And uh, with, with all the enthusiasm I could muster, I started lifting weights. And this is another important lesson, which is why I tell this in my story. After an entire year of lifting weights, all kinds of enthusiasm and energy and optimism, I gained one pound. I mean, I might as well just give up and, and stick with running, something I was naturally good at. But I reevaluated things and I searched for answers, much like when I tried being plant-based and it didn't really work for me, it was because I wasn't eating food. And so when I looked at what I was doing, why was I not gaining any muscle whatsoever, even though I was going to the gym? Well, I'll tell you why. I was still running. I was riding my bike. I was doing push-ups and crunches, and I was burning all kinds of calories and going to the gym. And I wasn't consuming enough to elicit the muscle gains that I was looking for. It wasn't scientifically possible for me to put on muscle. I wasn't consuming enough in relation to what I was expending. Much like the New Year's resolutions that so many of us struggle with to lose weight, most of us never put ourselves in a position mathematically, scientifically, where we're going to actually lose weight and burn body fat. And that's because of one thing, a lack of awareness of our calorie intake versus expenditure. So once I figured that out, I did the Body for Life program. I'm sure many of you are aware of it or some of you have heard of it. It's probably the most successful body transformation program in history by Bill Phillips that came around in the late 1990s. I did that program, nothing changed. I was only a week older from when I tried for a whole year and gained one pound and was pretty much utter failure as far as my muscle building journey. Nothing changed. I wasn't older. I wasn't more mature, ready to put on more muscle. I just tried a new program the next week. It was a 12 week program. And what happened was uh, I put on 19 pounds in 12 weeks and thought, well, this is going well. Let's, let's keep it going. So I kept going and put on 28 pounds in 10 months. And by the next year, I put on another 10 pounds and I was a competitive bodybuilder before I knew it. I was a, a, a thin long distance runner and just a few years later, two or three years later, I was a competitive bodybuilder. I'd put on a lot of muscle and by the following year, I won my first bodybuilding competition and then I competed in the natural bodybuilding world championships. And then I went on to film documentaries and be on magazine covers and write books and tour to five continents, talking to people about how to build your body on a plant-based diet because I figured it out. So what was happening there? What was Bill Phillips doing differently in the Body for Life program? From my perspective, he was doing two things. He was requiring from his followers or people who would adhere to the program, participants, just requiring two things. And that was consistency and accountability the two things that are often missing in our fitness journey. I mean, how many of you have had a New Year's resolution that didn't work out? Probably most of you. How many of you have tried to build muscle and, and it just didn't happen? It didn't work. Or how many of you have tried over and over to lose weight and it just doesn't seem to be happening? I've been there on all, all those fronts. And as I figured this out time and time again, I realized that I was not being totally transparent or accountable with myself. I was either obsessively exercising too much or I was under eating or I was overeating in some cases where I even became clinically obese later on once I got injured and I continued to eat like a 200 pound bodybuilder, even though I didn't train for five months when I injured my spine and I became obese. Because we develop these habits that we follow over and over and over, and it leads to specific outcomes. 
so once I figured out this consistency and accountability and transparency thing with the body for life program, which basically meant eat six times a day, three bigger meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, three smaller meals, snacks in between. You're consistently nourished all throughout the day. You're ready to work out anytime you're recovering nutritionally from workouts uh, by replenishing electrolytes, carbohydrates, amino acids, the building blocks of protein, all that stuff. And he was also requiring us to exercise six days a week, but never more than an hour. It wasn't intense. It wasn't over the top, it was 52 minute workouts, 46 minute workouts. We all have 1,440 minutes in a day. This program was asking for about 45 minutes of our time. I did it, I was brand new to this. I didn't even know what competitive bodybuilding was, but I transformed my physique wholesale completely in a short amount of time from 120 pounds to about 185, got into bodybuilding, took it up to well over 200 pounds, 220 pounds at my peak. And I did it by understanding what we're gonna talk about next. Calorie intake versus expenditure and nutrient density. So first of all, let's start here. How many people here, well, 115 of us, wow, great to see you all here. How many people here, uh, even though I can't see you, uh, you would have a show of hands, uh, know precisely based on your gender, age, height, weight, and activity level, precisely how many calories you expend per day, four digit number. Everyone has your number? Okay, great. So everyone basically has to know that number if you have any kind of fitness goal whatsoever, because that's the only way to know how many calories to consume in order to maintain weight, to lose weight, or to gain weight. Otherwise, you're just guessing. And before everyone starts throwing tomatoes at me and saying, yeah, but you know, Esselstyn says don't count calories and all this kind of stuff, I agree with that. But first, if you have a fitness goal, not just a health goal, not just a health, longevity, wellness goal, but if you're trying to lose weight or if you're trying to build muscle, or if you're trying to maintain skeletal muscle, you have to know what you're doing right now. Most people, don't know thyself. If I ask the 116 of you listening live right now to recount precisely what you ate yesterday, 95% of you would be wrong when you tried to recall it. You would be wrong on the exact foods. You'd be wrong on the serving sizes. You'd be wrong on the calories. You just don't know. Even those of us who track it every day at times using apps still often don't know. And so, what I'm encouraging you to do, just to get to know who you are, what your nutritional habits are, what you do and don't consume, is to, for about a week, follow me here, for about a week, track your nutritional intake. This is profoundly important, especially if you have a fitness goal, or even a health goal for that matter. You can use something like Chronometer, it's an app, or MyFitnessPal, another app, to do this, to track all your food. And what, I'll, what I'd also like you to do is use what's called a Harris Benedict calculator, Harris hyphen Benedict calculator. In that calculator, you're going to enter in your gender, age, height, weight, and very importantly, and also important, you don't lie or exaggerate your activity level. Okay. So I just turned 44 a couple of days ago. So I would enter in male, 44 years old, six foot tall. I'm actually down to 185 pounds right now. I just lost 25 pounds in the last six months deliberately, which I'll talk about later in fat burning. And I work out at the gym five days a week, plus go on dog walks daily. That will give me a number, approximately how many calories I expend every day. For me, it's about 3000. What does that mean? What that means is for Robert, for me to maintain the same weight of about 185 pounds because of how active I am and my metabolism and all these other factors. I need to consume about 3000 calories per day. If I wanna bulk up, like I was 212 pounds just back in August or September before this weight loss, deliberate fat loss journey I did, I would eat more. I would need to eat a surplus of calories combined with resistance weight training to put on muscle. Now, if I want to lose fat, burn fat, I need to eat in a deficit. So uh, spoiler alert, 
Um, I spent months consuming about 22 to 2300 calories a day just recently. Even though I'm burning 3000 a day, I consume about 2300, deficit of 700. And that's what helped me lose 25 pounds, even though I still felt full and satiated because I was thoughtful about the foods that I chose to eat based on nutrient density, which we'll talk about next. Now, before we go any further and you say, Robert, come on, come on, Robert, 3000 calories. That's a lot. Are you sure about that? What is the average adult daily American calorie intake right now? The average adult American daily consumes 3,540 calories per day. Now you might say, well, not, not this group, not this whole food plant-based group. No, we're talking about general population, all of us. All of us factored into this. Those of us on a low calorie diet, on a high calorie diet, on a processed food diet, on a uh, crap diet, calorie rich and processed, write that one down. Uh, those of us eating crap, calorie rich and processed foods. Yeah, the average adult American consumes 3,540 calories a day. So even though I was consuming 3,000 calories a day or a little more than that, that, I was even below average. To recap, you have to know. Otherwise, you're just guessing and you just hope that your work ethic or your, your genetics are good enough. If you really do have a goal, and that's why this is a, a building your body talk, not just a not just a health and longevity. And I'm just going to wing it and hope that it all works out. But if you want to build muscle strength, build muscle size, improve bone density through resistance training, burn body fat get leaner, have greater endurance, uh, be more fit overall, put yourself in a position to reduce your risk of injury and prevent injury, then you have to know what your calorie expenditure is versus your intake. That will reveal precisely, precisely why you're not losing weight or why you are losing weight or why you're gaining weight, whether it's wanted or unwanted weight, uh, whether it's added body fat or added muscle or a little bit of both. You will understand this through, again, I'll repeat, the Harris-Benedict calculator. That's how you determine, based on your gender, age, height, weight, and activity level, how many calories you expend. Know that number. Maybe for you, it's 2,400. Maybe for someone else, 2,600. Maybe for, for someone else, it's 3,200. 2,200, whatever it is. Your number is your number. And all those things, gender and, and height and weight and age, all, those all factor in. That's why we eat differently as you know, 22 year old, you know, 300 pound NFL players uh, versus those of us in our 50s, 60s, 70s who are doing something different. So, so uh, Robert, we just put that in the chat. Um, we found a calculator there. I don't know if you could see it. OK, great. Uh, I thought that would be really fun for people to try. It's the is that the Cornell reasonable one to use? That they all seem that was the one that came. I yeah, came there's a with. bunch of them out there. You can even yeah. you could um you know a calorie calculator or whatever but it's it's fundamentally important yeah. on a, a fitness journey to know this and over the decades that i've been speaking about this on tour those who have a grasp on that have this very very important word which is control control over your outcome i i mean and i'm not unique i'm not special i'm not you know, genetically gifted in a certain way. I mean, I have no business in the sport of bodybuilding. I have no business being a champion bodybuilder. I was a hundred pounds, you know, as a teenager and, and, and even into my twenties, 150 pounds. I wasn't destined to be a 220 pound bodybuilder, but it's something I wanted to do. And I figured out how to do that by knowing this Harris Benedict equation or Harris Benedict calculator over a decade ago putting it to use, and then using something like Chronometer or MyFitnessPal to track your daily food intake. Now, why is that important? And they might say, I'm not going to do that. That's That just goes against the uh, you know, laws of nature and eating naturally and all this kind of stuff. Sure. But you might find, you might find that you have some deficiencies. You want to know something? I've been doing this plant-based diet for three decades. And there are times where I go days without eating certain foods like leafy greens. You may say, how is that possible, Robert? Come on, they're the healthiest foods, which we're going to get to in a moment in, in, in uh, nutrient density. But that's 
how it goes sometimes. That's, there are people here listening who, who consume uh, caffeine every single day and are addicted to it and don't know it. People here listening who consume uh, uh, alcohol perhaps every day or every week and, and don't know it, or don't eat more than one serving of fruit a day and are not aware of it, or consume only the equivalent of two glasses of water, but are not aware of it because it's it's never been tracked or documented. And And how amazing it can be to improve upon our health and wellness once we become aware of those things. I wanna move along here. Uh, I'm tempted to share stories, which I do in a 90 minute lecture, but I'm not going to today, but things I discovered about myself, which is the one I will tell you is that I, I was addicted to caffeine, even though I've been drug and alcohol free my entire life. Uh, I actually had to go to a fasting center to break my caffeine addiction, yerba mate was my was my drink, and it had control over me, and I did not have control over it. I've been caffeine free since 2018, and it changed my life. It also made me aware of foods that I do and don't eat, which then changed my menu and meal plans so that I would incorporate the most nutrient dense foods, which we're now going to talk about. So we also need to be aware of. I told you this staggering number. 3,540 calories per day is the average adult uh, calorie consumption in America. Well, how is that possible? Well, I'll tell you how it's possible. 80% of Americans, 80% of Americans eat fast food every single week. 37% of Americans eat fast food every single day. 73.6% of Americans are overweight. 42.5% of Americans are obese. That is not to body shame anyone. And I've been there. I've been overweight for years, according to you know the, the figures. I've even been obese when I've been injured and just kept eating all kinds of processed food because I was depressed for the first time in my life with a major sports spine injury and was unable to exercise for half a year. It's not to body shame anyone, but it's to sound the alarm that when we have three quarters of our population overweight, half our population obese, this usually means there's some other issues going on perhaps heart disease, perhaps hypertension, perhaps diabetes, perhaps these things are just knocking on our door. And that's why we have one in two approximately, the numbers are uh, incredible these days. One in two of us will get cancer or diabetes or heart disease or whatever, it's, it's very high. It's, but one in three, one in two, or, or when you factor in all the, the diet related degenerative diseases, we're essentially a uh, you know, 50-50 shot. Uh, we're very likely gonna be stuck with something due to diet and lifestyle. So I wanna really quickly cover calorie density. Many of you know it, but we're gonna go over it really quickly. Let's look at leafy green vegetables on one end. Leafy green vegetables, they have about a hundred calories per pound, actually a little bit less than that. On the other end of the spectrum, we have oils, pure fat, 4,000 calories per pound. So a 40 fold difference. I mean, no surprise, we have all kinds of, uh, obesity and, and struggles with, with body weight as a society because oil is in every prepared food and fast food. And we already know that 80% of us eat fast food every week. We know that we gravitate towards calorie rich and processed foods. We know that. That's, that's, that is who we are as a society. That defines the American diet. There's no way around it. Let's look at the other, other foods. Other vegetables, broccoli, et cetera, cruciferous vegetables, about 200 calories per pound. Okay, let's go over here to, let's pick one, let's pick butter, 3,200 calories per pound. Okay, so <laughs> 3,000 calories more per pound than the vegetables. Let's go to fruit, my favorite food. I, I love fruit, can't get enough of it. I got all kinds of fruit upstairs you wouldn't even know. Berries and citrus and bananas and you know heavier fruits and frozen fruits and all kinds of different things. Avocado, the whole thing. Fruits are about 300 calories per pound. But over here, another plant, another plant-based category, nuts and seeds, about 2,800 calories per pound compared to fruit at 300. That's why we need to be aware of nut butters and nuts and, and that kind of thing as far as the calorie richness of it, the fat content, the density of it. Moving right along quickly, let's move over to the, the prime category, potatoes, rice, oats, lentils, most legumes, and grains and root vegetables, 
they're going to vary by 100 or so calories, but let's just call them a nice round group of 500 calories per pound. This is the foundation of our diet, the rice, the oats, the potatoes, the sweet potatoes, the beans of all types, the lentils, the cornerstones. I just had uh, rice and garbanzo beans right before we're coming to do this call uh, uh, with some other size, uh, sauces, spices, that kind of stuff. It's fantastic. But then you go to junk food, 2,300 calories per pound. That's pastries, donuts, cookies, crackers, breads, you know, all, all that kind of stuff, the junk food category. It's no wonder we struggle. And then let's go right in the middle, animal protein. Animal protein, it varies a little bit. Chicken's a little bit less than beef or chickens versus cows, whatever. But it's about a thousand, about a thousand calories per pound. So already just double the calorie density of the, the main staples in a plant-based diet. That already just shows you that it's gonna be much harder to maintain weight or lose body weight when we're consuming animal protein. Also, there's things like cheese that's 1,700 calories per pound, almost double calories per pound of meat. How do we consume meat? Just on its own? Just a piece of meat here and there? No, it's often covered in oil at 4,000 calories a pound, covered in cheese, covered in dairy or egg sauces, mayonnaise, other sauces, often with a bun that's, you know, maybe 1,500 calories per pound at the butter at over 3,000 calories a pound of butter, in its totality, in its package, we have to look at how a food is consumed, right? I mean, I just eat blueberries just kind of by themselves and maybe on oatmeal, maybe uh, on, a, on a smoothie bowl, maybe in a smoothie or mostly just by hand. I've got them upstairs right now. But when you eat meat, it's not necessarily like that. It's, it's the oils, it's the sauces, the seasonings, the, the breads, and many people eat uh, French fries with it a milkshake with it, a soda with it. You can see how that's problematic. All right, I don't want to linger too long in this, but you get the idea. When you have an awareness of calorie density and you eat on the low side, leafy greens, fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, and limit nuts and seeds, you are on a, a, a path to success in just bodily health, wellness, and managing weight, which so many, so many of us struggle with, myself included, at certain times. Now let's look at the nutrient density of foods. Many of you might be aware of the ANDI score uh, created by Dr. Joel Furman, Aggregate, Aggregate Nutrient Density Index, Aggregate Nutrient Density Index, ANDI score. 37 different uh, factors to determine this. So 37 different qualifiers, so looking at vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, dietary cholesterol, saturated fat, all these different components, maybe nitric oxide or some of these other uh, phytonutrients, uh, the macronutrient breakdown of a given food. A score from 1,000 down to zero, okay? You know what's at the top? Leafy green vegetables, kale, watercress, collard greens, mustard greens. A score of 1,000. Then you have Brussels sprouts and spinach and a few others a little bit lower and you know, on down, you, then you get some great fruits and, and uh, legumes and seeds and, and all that. So Dr. Furman has this calculation that health equals nutrients divided by calories. Basically, how many nutrients per calorie? So when you eat a bread roll or a donut, just something common, or a burger, what's the nutrients per calorie? Well, it's really high in calories and really low in nutrients. So those are, those are obviously a non-starter. You, you keep those foods out of the diet as much as possible. But you look at like leafy green vegetables have the most bang for their buck, the most nutrients per calorie. But then you say, well, those are salad greens. There's, there's no calories in that. Exactly. That's why that cannot be the foundation of your diet. It can't just be salads unless the salads also have tofu, avocado, garbanzo beans, kidney beans, um, peppers, mushrooms, uh, lentils, olives. You see what I'm getting at? We can't just eat super low calories and expect to be full and satiated and vibrant and energ energetic, but we also need those nutrients. We need to look at that Andy score, pull it up. Dr. Furman, Andy score. And look at, wow, thousand, 
down to zero. And you have to go, if I'm not mistaken, and maybe correct me here, you've got to go all the way down to like 37 before you find the first animal product, which is salmon, which is historically known to be healthier than almost any other meats. You're going to pass all these vegetables, fruits, legumes, grains, nuts, and seeds before you get to the highest ranking animal-based food. But you also want to look at foods that have an almost zero score, no nutritional value. Save your money. Do not ever buy or consume when possible. And that's soda and chips. Many other foods too, candy, you know, cotton candy, donut, all these things factor in there. But but soda, because it's so commonly consumed, and then chips, you know, just potato chips, corn chips, there's just no nutritional value there. There might be on the avocado you're dipping them in or the tomato sauce you're dipping them in, but just remember the package that it comes with. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, running short on time for my next bullet points here, so we'll kind of run through them quickly. And we'll leave some time for Q&A. We, we, you saw the agenda. But I really wanted to make those points there. That even, even more than the exercises, more than the fitness, more than all that, you've got to know calorie density and nutrient density and make thoughtful decisions because every bite counts as far as what it's going to do for your body, as far as fueling, healing, recovering, or adding to excess calories, excess dietary cholesterol, excess saturated fat, um, pro-inflammatory food, all that stuff. We want to eliminate that as much as possible. Okay, so let's jump ahead quickly. Best foods for pre and post workout. Before workout, you want complex carbohydrates. You want fruit, you want uh, oatmeal, you want those kind of things. Potatoes, yams, sweet potatoes. If it's immediately before workout, go with fruit. Easily digested, it's in your system, it's utilized right away. Bananas, good way to go. I'm gonna speed through this here for, for a moment. We're talking like Dr. Gregor here in a moment. Uh, uh, you know, if it's a couple hours before workout, that's when oatmeal, rice, beans, burrito bowl, whatever, gives you longer lasting fuel, sweet potatoes, but right before workout, go with fruit. Berries are fantastic, bananas are great. Post-workout, what do you do when you exercise? What do you do? Well, you burn through carbohydrate fuel, so you need to replenish carbohydrates. You sweat out electrolytes, so you gotta replenish electrolytes. Banana and coconut water, great, great combo. Or just fruit and water, we'll do it. A variety of different fruits, we'll do it. And you create micro tears and muscle fibers especially through re resistance weight training. So you need amino acids, the building blocks of protein to repair. So I'll keep it simple. We can delve into it later in Q&A, but I like a burrito bowl, it's perfect. It's a combination of carbohydrates, proteins, fats, leafy greens, maybe you put in some mushrooms, which are great nutritionally. You put in tofu for added protein, uh, put in different... Um, peppers or vegetables, again, more diversity. You can put some broccoli in there. Why not? Um, something like a burrito bowl, an acai bowl or a smoothie bowl, very popular, especially in, in warm climates. I can't tell you how much I enjoy that after a, a hard workout in a warm climate to go eat just nutrient rich, antioxidant rich, water rich fruits. And you can eat a variety of them, some that are heavier, like mango and pineapple, some that are watery, you know, uh, watermelon, um, strawberries, and ones that are more dense, like uh, like like blueberries, uh, perhaps certain melons. Um, you can get a whole variety that makes it uh, really, really satisfying. Um, so bananas, of course, are fantastic. So uh, just keep that in mind. You don't need protein drinks. You don't need protein shakes. You can if you want. You don't need it. You get the amino acids, the building blocks of protein from eating tofu and lentils and beans and green vegetables and root vegetables and all the grains and legumes and nuts and seeds. All right. Now, just to, in the interest of time, let's move right ahead to how do you build muscle in the first place? Well, you've got to do some sort of resistance training and especially you want to train lower body if you're able to, if you're able to. All, all the studies tend to show that lower body strength is just the best for building muscle, for building bone density, for preventing injuries, for burning calories, for getting fit, for getting strong, all those different things, lower body exercise. But do, I'm, I'm going to the gym right after this, as soon as we're done chatting today. Uh, you, you've got to do whatever is a form of resistance training that you enjoy and that you will do consistently. And when it comes to burning fat, 
you simply have to burn more calories than you consume. I was just telling uh, uh, Dr. Barnett before we went live, I haven't gone a single day this year walking fewer than 10,000 steps. I've walked up to 46,000 steps in one day and I averaged 20,000 steps for months on end. That's about 10 for me. Everyone has a slightly different step count or gait or cadence. But for me, 10,000 steps is about five miles. And I average five to 10 miles walked every single day. And that's how even with, without trying, I maintain the 25 pounds I just lost. Even actually when I try to bulk up a bit more, but I keep walking 15, 20,000 steps, I can't even put weight on if I wanted to. That's how powerful, how powerful movement and exercise is. We know it from the blue zones. We know it from cardiovascular training. We know that consistency leads to those kind of results. Last two things we're doing. I'm almost right on time here. <laughs> last two things, very important. Save the best for last supplementation and protein. Vitamin B12 is recommended for everyone. It doesn't come from animals. It doesn't come from plants. It's a bacteria that's often found on red meat. It's a little bit harder to find in the plant-based diet, but it's fundamentally, fundamentally important, fundamentally important for brain health and for many other functions. Everybody essentially recommends taking a vitamin B12 supplement is harder to get in our very sterile and clean food system. I, I just came back from Asia, a recent tour. Uh, I was actually, Actually, I was in the Caribbean too a few days ago, but you, you know, when you're in certain places where the food is not quite as clean, you, you might get some B12 that way just from the, the dirtiness of the food. But in, in our very Western sterile clean food system, which is good for not getting cholera and all these other things, then um, we need a supplement with B12. As I mentioned earlier, protein powders are not necessary. It's mostly a marketing scheme, to be honest. Uh, and I, I write about that in my books. Where that comes from is a byproduct, byproduct of the milk industry having whey and casein that used to be, used to be thrown out. And now it's a multi-billion dollar industry convincing people that they need to continue to breastfeed as adults and drink the, 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 the milk or milk proteins and byproducts uh, of breast milk from other species as adults. It is a very bizarre practice that, that we do as the only species that does this. Uh, the only species that continues to drink milk after infancy as well, but we found a way to turn something into a profitable commodity. So we do it. Um, there's many other, other supplements, creatine and branched chain amino acids, um, omega-3 essential fatty acids. Some can be fantastic for sports nutrition. I would say uh, DHA, EPA, omega-3 essential fatty acid could be fantastic for overall health. The others are simply a preference. If you want creatine, it's well-tested, it's safe, one of the most tested supplements out there. It helps you build a bit of extra muscle mass. Um, you could do that. Uh, but really, I mean, I've been doing this. I've been supplement free ever since I worked for Full Silver Knives 12, 13 years, years ago. ago. I'm learning from the community college and that I've been the biggest and strongest and strongest fit I've ever been in my life, even in my 40s, 40s without the supplements, 70, 12. Lastly, protein. This could be its own talk for the allotted time. But I think most of us know that protein is fairly easy to get if we eat enough calories. That's the whole point. If you know your calorie needs based on the Harris Benedict calculator and based on what you actually consume, if you eat adequate calories, you very, very, very likely will consume adequate protein. But if you need to focus on extra protein intake, that's where tofu, tempeh, seitan, lentils, uh, peanut butter, those types of foods are a little bit higher in protein, especially soy foods, edamame, tofu being uh, my favorites. If you have a personal preference or bias towards a protein drink because it's convenient, it's tasty, you drink it on the way home from exercise, fine, um, fair enough. But we need, um, I know the numbers in kilograms, uh, 0 0.8 to 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight for general society. It jumps significantly up for those who are exercising, especially exercising rigorously to 1.2 to 2.0 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. What that comes out to is about for active individuals, weight trainers, especially it comes out to about 0 0.8 to one gram of protein per pound of body weight. Uh, and that's honestly, that's still, that's still higher than what I consume as a 
typically for the last eight years, I've been over 200 pounds. I'm only under now just from a, a, a very recent uh, weight loss challenge that I did and, and succeeded so greatly that I actually had to slow the progress and reintroduce more calories and cut back on the walking because I was so successful at it. But that sustained me for a decade, over 200 pounds, up to 220 pounds, eating on the very low end of the protein intake. I'm just one person, but it, it shows me that perhaps we don't even need as much as some of the high end recommendations suggest. I wanna leave you with something here as we're uh, approaching the end. At least if I'm doing the math right, we're approaching the end here. But I leave, I end every talk with this. So I hope, I hope you enjoy it. It's a quote from H. Jackson Brown Jr. from his book, P.S. I Love You. When he said, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the things that you did do. And whether it's 20 years from now or two years from now, you don't want to be asking what might have been. Like, man, I had the opportunity to start this fitness program and I just didn't believe in myself to do it. Or I, I was starting to get early signs of heart disease and, you know, clogged arteries and build up. And I just didn't do anything about it. Or my, my family, my loved ones are, are struggling with obesity or food addiction or diet related diseases. And I know, I know a plant-based food intervention could be helpful and could perhaps even save their life. But I didn't say anything. So whether it's 20 years from now, five years from now, or a year from now, We're going to be more disappointed by the things we didn't do, the actions we didn't take, times we didn't speak up, the occasions we didn't believe in ourselves, or the times that we just quit and didn't think we were worthy or good enough, or because someone in our life who we trusted said it's never going to work out for us. The only reason I'm here talking to you today is a New York Times bestselling author champion vegan bodybuilder who had no business doing either one of those it was because I showed up every day. I showed up every day and said, today, I'm going to take one step closer to being where I want to be in health, in fitness, in longevity, and in wellness. And that's my message for you, that you can take action and make it happen. You just got the rundown of 10 different bullet points of calorie intake, expenditure, density, nutrient density, pre and post workout meals, supplementation, protein, and hopefully a little bit of dose of inspiration and motivation too. So what do you do with it? Where do you go from here? That's what I'd like to leave you with. Thank you so much. And I'm here for uh, Q&A and sorry for going, I think uh, a couple minutes over. But no need to apologize. That was I appreciate fantastic. the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If, if Dr. Friedman and our medical student Ashish could uh, please reappear, yeah, through the magic of Zoom. There's Dr. Freeman, our professor of medicine at the University of Rochester. Uh, um, Ashish uh, Bardwaj, am I saying your name correctly? The, That's uh, correct. Yeah, fourth, fourth year medical student um, at uh, URMC. Uh, and we're going to go into Q&A, but before we do that, I just want to share my screen to remind people a little bit about us. If you uh, just joined us, um, we are Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute. I am the president and founder. Uh, we started back in 2015 and uh, have been um, steadily growing. We have no idea how we got here, but we run a 15-day whole food plant-based jumpstart, which we developed ourselves, which is uh, certified by the American College of uh, uh, lifestyle medicine. Also, we run the Lift Project, also certified by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. We did not develop that program, but we're pre preferred provider of facilitated um, uh, cohorts. And then we also run health coaching. If you take a look at our website, rochesterlifestylemedicine.org, please check that out. And um, you can uh, see our programs there. And uh, thank you for attending. Uh, we'll put our, uh, in the chat, we'll put a, 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 um, a URL that you can click on to make a donation, or if you'd like to aim your phone at that QR code, I'll leave it up there for a few more seconds. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to let our talented staff who have been perusing the questions, uh, go ahead and pick, pick which ones they want to start with.
Ashish, you want to start? Uh, sure. So um, Marilyn asks, I'm a avid long distance runner. I'm going to be running the Boston Marathon in April. I feel like I'm always hungry and eating. I'm plant-based. Is this normal for an athlete? Love it. Great question. And best of luck in the Boston Marathon. My my co-author of, of my New York Times bestseller, Matt Frazier from No Meat Athlete, qualified for that as well. And if I ever get back into running, maybe uh, I'll put that on my list. Um, yeah, so it's a great question. And this comes up so often. I didn't have time to address it today. But perhaps one of the most common questions I've received over the last 30 years is that that I'm that I'm, I still find myself kind of hungry, and especially as I'm really active, I just don't seem to be getting really full, and that's where the calorie density of foods comes into play. So, uh, for example, I, I told you right before this talk, I had a, a big bowl of rice, garbanzo beans, some sauce and spices and flavorings. That was really filling compared to. I had like some oranges before that because I wanted this. I wanted the nutritional benefits from the the citrus, the wellness. I've got I got to be up at four in the morning tomorrow. I'm off to Anaheim. I just got home two days ago and I'm on the road constantly. But I wasn't full from eating the oranges or from eating the berries. I needed something heavier. That's when I went for this hundreds of calories in a bowl, uh, rice and 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 beans. And I'm all, that's also knowing that I'm going to the gym right after this call. And so what I would encourage you to do is look at your long distance runner. So look at some of the more calorie dense foods that are conducive for, for long distance running. Um, maybe that's adding in some, uh, some avocado. Maybe that's some nut butters on bananas. I mean, bananas are already 120 calories per, I think, per medium banana. That's fantastic. And that's what I eat before running, which I still do a little bit of, but adding some nut butter to that, you get those, those deep, uh, long lasting calories from the, the fats and the protein in the, uh, in the nut butter. And that will give you an extra push. That's why so many of these bars that we enjoy, um, you know, the cliff bars, the lower bars, the sports performance bars, whatever's out there, they typically have nuts. Uh, and nut butters as well as grains because they have the carbohydrate fuel and the fat fuel at nine calories per gram fat. So um, that's what I would recommend. Um, just incorporating those throughout the day, either before, during, or after your run. And certainly as you replenish to make sure you are full, you could even try smoothies with avocado, white beans, other types of filling foods. Um, and something like oatmeal with berries and walnuts, because the walnuts are going to have the calorie density plus the omega-3 essential fats. The berries give you some calorie density plus antioxidants. And then the oats, of course, 500 calories per pound, much more filling than having like cantaloupe and honeydew. So best of luck to you. Go get them next month. Take on Boston and represent the plant-based lifestyle. Excellent. Fantastic. Fantastic. Dr. Friedman, have you got a question there? So there, there are actually several questions that have to do with age. And as a geriatrician, I'm uh, very interested in, in the answer. So um, questions about, you know, uh, do the muscle building strategies apply to a 70 year old? And, um, you know, how feasible is it to, to build muscle after, after age 70? I am so glad that you asked that. Uh, like I said, I just came from the vegan cruise. Of course, I've got How Not to Age behind me on the bookshelf and Dr. Gregor gave his presentation there and he was there all week, including participating in my fitness class. I was having Dr. Gregor doing push-ups and high-fiving his partner. And there were, and that audience, the reason I say that, we have about 2,000 people on board uh, on the vegan cruise and most are in the 55 to 75-year-old age group. Th that's who attends my workouts, my lectures, my presentations and everyone else's presentations. It is absolutely uh, fundamentally important as we age, 60s, 70s, and beyond, to do some sort of weight-bearing exercise. We need to keep our bones strong. We need to keep our muscles strong. We need to be uh, prepared for the unfortunate. Uh, sometimes there's some you know, unfortunate um, slips or falls or bumps or this and that, and having the more muscle strength, the, the bone strength, even the muscle mass is helpful. Now, is it just as easy to build muscle at age 70 uh, compared to age 30? Of course not. Uh, 
things are things are more challenging as far as muscle building and protecting skeletal muscle mass as we get probably beyond 60 or so but it doesn't mean you can't do it it, it, in fact, it should be highly encouraged. But what I would say is instead of using dumbbells and barbells, which anyone, even me at age 44, can have trouble balancing them and you know, they're they're hard on the joints, hard on the body, use some sort of machines, you know, pressing and curls and rows and all these types of controlled movements that are resistance weight training. You, I see them all the time. I will be going to the gym shortly and see lots of people, I'm sure in the 60, 70 plus demographic who are using the uh, the cycle of, of, of machines to help train different muscle groups. So um, I know it's an important topic. I know it's worth lingering on. And I would again, focus on the lower body movements. I just came from a, a couple of lectures from Dr. Dean Sherzai, one of the, the leading brain health uh, doctors who said uh, for, for, for brain health, one of the best things we can do is lower body exercise as well. And as Dr. Michael Clapper and everyone else recommends and suggests, we also need to get the exercise benefits from the resistance weight training, the, the muscle strength, the flexibility, the, the protection and uh, against injury to some degree, the balance, the coordination, the circulation, the lung strength, the endurance strength, Weight training absolutely should be performed by everyone at every age. You just do what works for you and what fits within your 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 program and your um, you know capabilities. If you have some injuries, like I've got some lower back injuries from sports over the years, uh, or wrist injury or whatever it is, you work around that. You find things that you can do. And so absolutely, and, and and I also want to reiterate one more thing. I hung out with Dan Bootner from the Blue Zones on my birthday last week. He can't stress enough movement, 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 walking uphill, gardening. I'm not saying everybody needs to go to the gym. I think it's a great idea. But if it doesn't fit your schedule, your budget, your location, your accessibility, your proximity, uh, or your desire to be in a big box gym there's plenty of stuff you can do with your own body mechanics walking uphill doing some push-ups or planks or body weight air squats lunges even dips on a on a bench the idea is to move and to move consistently and that is one of the biggest keys to longevity and we know that from all the studies that we've seen in the longest lived populations around the world who are active. Yeah, I, I have to um, uh, <clears throat> emphasize that and just to pile on a little bit. So I'm going to be 70 this year. Um, I'm stronger now than I was 20 years ago. Uh, you know, as, as uh, Robert said, I run, you know, I run a 5k every morning. So 3.1 miles, that's how I start the day, but I can also do 20 pull-ups and I just hit 60 push-ups the other day. So uh, and that's without going to the gym, right? I used to actually, until the pandemic, I was going to the gym pretty regularly. So I have to uh, agree with you about using the machines to avoid the injuries. Um, but, you know, I've managed to stay in shape even without going to the gym. So uh, I love that. And, you know, as a geriatrician, you know, Dr. Freeman wants her patients to be strong. So if and when they fall, they can catch themselves and not break something. Uh, and maybe they won't fall. So, um, yeah, actually, I'm I'm going to, um, we are officially ending now because it is a little after 8.30, but as promised, uh, Robert Cheek has agreed to stick around, so we'll probably go on for another 10 minutes or so, so yeah. uh, if you if the audience want to stick around, that's great, and Ashish, Ashish do you have any, uh, another question for Robert, please? Um, yeah, there seems to be um, some questions in the chat regarding... Um, recommended resistance exercise uh, regimen per week, like frequency, time of day, intensity, rate of escalation, um, as well as um, resources for uh, building muscle like website, books, apps, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's part of my 90 minute presentation. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I can only squeeze in so much. Um, and I have some amazing stories, by the way. I, when I give like a 90 minute, I, I tell some incredible stories of, uh, body transformation and how diet fuels success for endurance and strength athletes and amazing weight loss and all this stuff. But let's, let's, let's jump right into it. So, um, 
so what we want to do is create some sort of consistent routine. So um, when I go to the gym, I'm looking, and again, like Dr. Barnett said, you don't have to go to the gym. I just did a whole week worth of body weight exercises uh, on, a, on a vegan cruise for audiences of 50 to 100 at a time. And we got amazing workout with just our body mechanics. That's it. But what we want to do is create some sort of consistent routine. Let's just say it is a gym. And I think going anywhere from three to five days a week for about an hour is, is ideal. So some sort of warm up uh, for a few minutes, we want to get blood flow going, increase circulation, reduce risk of injury, warming up, and then picking what we're doing for that particular workout. Maybe it's an upper body workout. We're training the entire upper body, chest and back and shoulders, arms, abs. And then the, another day is a lower body workout. Or maybe we're just doing one or two muscle groups at a time. What, what, I, what I like to do is perform about 20 to 25 total sets. So maybe picking five different exercises. Let's just say, let's just make it easy. Five different exercises to do five sets of each and each set start out with a little bit higher repetition, maybe even 20 or 15 to get blood flow and get it moving, get warmed up. And then your next set maybe is 12 reps and then it's 10 and then it's even eight. And uh, if you want to even push it a little further uh, intensity wise, go down to six. Uh, but typically 20, 15, 12, 10 and eight is just a great way to go. So are you increasing the, the uh, resistance with each set if you're going down in number or? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So oh. let's, let's just, let's just pick a number. Let's say I'm doing a chest exercise for 50 pounds on a machine. I'll do 50 pounds for about 20 reps. I'm getting warmed up. I'm getting lo loosened up. I'm getting the movement going. All right. Now move it to 60 pounds. All right. More resistance. Now I'm going to do, uh, what I say, we start at 20. Now we'll do, now I'll do 15. Okay. Now up to 70 pounds more resistance. It's harder to move. I'm going to do 12. Let's change it to 80 pounds. Now I can barely squeeze out 10, but I know I can push myself a little more. Let's go up to 90 pounds and let's get eight reps. And so I do that for each exercise that I do. In fact, I'm going to go train uh, chest uh, later today, uh, later tonight. And I'll do that exact same thing. And then I'll move to another exercise. How much, how much time between sets? Oh, depending on the muscle group. If it's a big muscle group like legs, sometimes a good two, three minutes, depending on the effort, the exertion, but usually about a minute, um, a minute or two, um, especially with this pretty manageable weight where you're doing 15 reps, you know, that's you, a minute or even a little bit less is just fine. Just fine. So good question. And I, and I sorry if I overlook some of these things, it's so second nature sure. to me, I have to slow down. Um, and so that's how I, I would pick about five exercises for a given one hour workout, do five sets of each, which is increasing the resistance, therefore increasing the weight each time. We're lowering the number of repetitions with about one minute, 90 seconds rest in between each one. And then when you change exercises, I go from that chest press to maybe let's say a shoulder press, give it a, a good couple minutes in between. Like now I've finished with one muscle group. I'm going to go to the next. I do five sets of uh, shoulder press. Now let's say I'm going to do some back rows. I really want to balance out the upper body. And now I'm going to do five sets there. Same kind of thing. Work your way up to it. About a minute rest in between each set. And you may notice that as you get deeper into the workout, you're like, I don't need to do 20 reps anymore. Like I'm really warmed up. I'll start at, at 12 and I'll go all the way down to maybe a power set of, of five reps because I want to uh, push myself. And the whole idea is to get this progressive overload where over time, you can do more reps with the same weight. So like that, that a given weight, let's say a hundred pounds becomes easier over time. You can do more reps and then you just increase the weight uh, to 110 or 120 or whatever the case is. So that's how I would approach it. Um, it's up to you as an individual, what your intensity level is like. Uh, I, I certainly recommend doing beyond going through the motions beyond just being there like, I got myself here and that's all I'm going to do, but to actually exert yourself a little bit um, and, and do some light stretching in between, you know, like some movement in between uh, to, to stay loose, to be injury free to the best of your ability. So warm up some light stretching in between some range of motion stuff, you know, arm circles. Uh, if you're training legs, kind of bouncing around, skipping around a little bit, staying loose 
and and then just do this three to five days a week until you build up this adaptation where you're like, man, I'm noticing greater endurance, greater strength, improved mood even. Um, I, I notice I maybe I feel better, like I look forward to it. And so now I want to do four days a week instead of three, or I want to do five instead of four. Or maybe if I'm really ambitious, I'll do six. We still want some rest and recovery, of course. But if we have it at a, at a manageable volume, even six days a week is okay. But um, but find a routine that works for you. People, just to finish this, my very last answer for this one, people often ask me, Robert, what's the best exercise to do? And the answer is the one that you'll actually do. Like the one that you will be compelled or motivated or inspired to, because it's very tempting. It's very tempting to stay in a seated position on a very comfortable couch or chair with the stimulation of a television or movie or something in, or the internet in front of you. And that makes it very hard to get to the gym. But if you know your why, like I'm sure Dr. Barnett has a reason why he runs a 5k every day. There's probably a deep rooted reason to, cr to create that habit that's <laughs> wrapped into wellness and longevity and leading by example and, and how he feels. We can all find that, right? I mean, my, for me, it, my, it's my image, it's my reputation, it's my identity. It's, I'm often introduced as a vegan bodybuilder. I want to represent what I set out to do decades ago in a positive light. And I got to go do that, but I also enjoy the process. I've got, I have fun doing it. So find the exercise that you enjoy and it could be dance. It could be gardening. It could be skiing. It could be hiking. Doesn't have to be the gym. Be swimming, riding a bike playing pickleball, the fastest growing sport in North America. Don't judge yourself or look down on yourself if you don't go to the gym. If you're showing up every day and saying, I'm, I'm going to move my body, I'm getting my 10,000 steps in, and I'm doing it in a fun way, in a social environment with friends or loved ones, you are on a great path to health and wellness and longevity. And I say, keep that train going. That's great. Thanks for that. Uh I think it's Dr. Fema's turn. Um, yeah, uh, a question from Dr. Graff. Um, is the burned calorie estimate on the Fitbit accurate? It uh, seems to change daily depending on how active she is and it, it, you know, it records your gender, height and weight. Yeah, I've got one right, right here too. It's, it's a great question about the accuracy of some of these tools. I don't think that they're perfect, but I think it's the best that we have right now. Some are more high tech than others. There's all these different rings you can wear and these different sensors you can wear. I actually don't get caught up into all that performance stuff. I just want the basics, you know, like to have a, a, a basic understanding of how many steps and approximately how many calories I'm expending during that time. And I want to make that very clear. We don't need to get caught up in the nuances or in the minutia, like, ah, I was out in the garden, but I only, you know, I was weeding the carrots today and it wasn't as productive as when I'm moving the pumpkins because they were heavier and I'm, bur I'm burning more. No, it's the fact that you're in the garden. You're in the garden, you already won. You already won. So if we go to the gym tonight and I'm there with my effort and I see someone else kind of pedaling the bike slowly, watching TV or whatever, I can't judge that individual because they may have already, they may have already just finished going for a run, which I didn't see. And they're just cooling down to help, you know, get some movement in their joints or the rehab a knee or whatever. And, and, and they're in their victory path. They're doing what they need to do for them. And so don't get too caught up in the accuracy of like, did it count all my flights of stairs? Because I thought I really, I, I really thought I did more because I find myself doing that sometimes. You know, my wife and I will have a very similar day, like on this vegan cruise where we ironically met 13 years ago. And why did I get so many more flights of stairs than her? And, you know, we have slightly different technology. Mine's a Fitbit, hers an Apple Watch. Who knows? But the fact is we both were doing it. We were both, imagine what we did back in the, you know, in the eighties or nineties, we didn't have any of this stuff. We just went yeah. out to run for 10 miles and we used mile markers, at least I did, they were put out by the city on the farm where I knew the distance that I was going. I used the city mile markers or 
you know, or I had a, t- a, a stopwatch and I knew how fast I was running per mile just based on my experience as a track and field athlete and had to do the math myself. It wasn't accurate, but I was doing it every day. So that's what I would suggest. Don't worry about, I, I, I say in my new book, don't sweat the small stuff. That's what I say in the Impactful Vegan, don't sweat the small stuff. Yeah, and I don't think the people in the blue zones got to be where they are because they were wearing these things. We know they weren't, right? Right, right, <laughs> right. They developed habits and cultivated and nurtured those habits to, to the point that they don't even think of it as exercise. They're just doing what they do every day and it's working. And so that's what we need to do. Do what yeah. we do and, and make it work for us. Well, listen, we uh, thank you so much for sticking around. Do you want to tell us about your next book that's about to come out? Yeah, I've got it right here. I, the Impactful Vegan. It's honestly, it's the best work I've ever done. It's my sixth book. It's the best one. It's basically how to be a, a heavily influential and impactful vegan using what I call our strong V, which are our skills, talents, resources, other strengths, network, generosity, and volunteering to most effectively reduce animal suffering, amplify vegan, amplify veganism, and promote a compassionate lifestyle. So I interviewed many of the world's leading experts from nonprofit organizations, for-profit companies, um, animal sanctuaries, and and those who have been uh, reducing animal suffering for decades. And it's a very uplifting book. It's an encouraging book. And it gives people really tangible resources and ideas and plenty of stories and examples of things you can do from voting with your dollars, your purchase power, your generous donations, or volunteering your time, or your very unique skill set or talents, your network community and resources to help animals in the most impactful ways. And it's, I mean, it's it's phenomenal. It, on my birthday last week, it became a number one bestseller in multiple categories on Amazon. I It's endorsed by Rich Roll and Dan Bootner and uh, Carly Bodrug and all kinds of wonderful uh, people in the, in the plant-based movement, whether they're physicians or authors or chefs or athletes or doctors of all types. Uh, and it's something I'm very, very proud of and very excited to have come out in hardcover in every store, every new bookstore in North America on June 25th, 2024. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. And uh, Robert, thank you so much for your time. It was very inspiring. Dr. Friedman, thank you for helping uh, uh, with the questions. Ashish, uh, help, uh, thank you for helping with the questions as well. Bob Frankie, our engineer in the background. Thank you, Bob, for doing a great job. And for people who are interested in more of what we do, please check out rochesterlifestylemedicine.org. You can check our very busy schedule and uh, the CME programs for physicians uh, and good, great programs for your patients and for the general public. And anyway, we'd love to see you. And good night, everybody. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Night.